My real point tonight, I'm playing with you. I don't know when the, Ezekiel, the Psalm 83 occurs. And I may be wrong about this, but I personally believe that Psalm 83 happens after the rapture. Ooh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute here. If Psalm 83 is on our near horizon, the rapture is even closer. If you study this, you think that, wow, I could visualize Psalm 83 occurring sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay, great. To the extent you believe that, you've painted yourself in a corner. Because if that's true, big if, but if that's true, the rapture is really soon. Now, I know if I ask you how, how many of you are excited about the rapture, all the hands will go up. But let me remind you of something else. What's the first thing that happens after the rapture of the church? Not on the earth. Who knows? What happens in your life ten minutes after the rapture? The Bema Seat of Christ. You and I have an opportunity to cram for the final. Okay, There's a final exam coming. And that, your re that's got nothing to do with your salvation in the sense of justification. And that's a whole study we can talk about another time. But the one thing you want to realize is that your opportunity to qualify for some surprises, favorable surprises, rewards, inheritance, live it what you want, your opportunity is your distance between here and the rapture. What you want to do is live your life moment by moment in anticipation of the fact the rapture can happen next week, next month. It might be quite a few years, don't know. But I do believe the rapture occurs before Psalm 83. And the more I study Psalm 83, the more I'm convinced it's ahead of Ezekiel 38. And there's a lot of aspects that are in place for the, both of those. So I'm not setting dates. Don't misquote me or misunderstand me. Okay. But I think a lot every day about the Bema Seat of Christ. Because it's no longer an academic concept. It's a reality that's going to confront all of us, every one of us. And there's something else I'd like to just touch on. I think I can squeeze this in in the timing here. The Bible talks about how God will wipe the tears from our eyes. It says that twice in Revelation. And that puzzles me. Why are there tears? There's no death, no sickness. Everything is pretty super, right? Why are there tears that he has to wipe away? I think I know the answer to that. And I'm uh, uh, indebted to... Uh, I always say Whittier, that's the wrong guy. Um, of all the words of tongue or pen... The saddest are these. It might have been. I think we're, what we're going to grieve over at the judgment seat of Christ is not our sins. They were paid for on a cross 2,000 years ago. That's a done deal. You can't add to it. If you try, that's blasphemy. He did it all. No problem. I think what's going to grieve us to tears when we're, we review our lives before our King and we're confronted with the wasted opportunities. Remember Eric Schindler in the last scene of that movie? Took his badge? Could have saved one more? In the car? Three or four more. He'd taken his millions and bought what they call the Schindler. <laughs> and he was torn up because he could have done a little more. And what's going to upset me then are the things I could have done. Those moments when I wasn't quite bold enough to challenge somebody about the gospel. 
those moments that I wasted in silly trivia, rather than being in the Word, rather than applying myself to the King's business. What's going to grieve me aren't my missteps or sin, because that's been paid for. That'll be confessed and paid for. I'm not, that, I don't think that's going to be, to me that won't be the issue. The issue is going to be, how diligent was I for the opportunities put in my path? How much fruit did I bear for Him from the Holy Spirit? Nothing I contrived. Don't misunderstand. Heavens, don't get into work strip. That's silliness. But how often have I frittered away, wasted opportunities? I think it's going to grieve me. Well, anyway, what I'm really getting at is if the rapture, if somehow you knew that the rapture was a certain number of months away, what would you do? Whatever it is, you ought to do it now. Because it might be not far away. Your opportunity to improve the inheritance that's there for you will derive from your fruit bearing now. And what I'm trying to do is challenge you to raise the bar on your personal walk with Him. Do whatever, I, I'm not talking about specifics, do whatever it takes to improve your walk with Him, with the King. So, so uh, let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We are really overwhelmed as we, as we begin to perceive the potential applications to our geopolitical horizon today. We do pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit, you would guide our thoughts and our studies that we might better understand the implications of these passages, that we might better understand what it is that you would have of us in the opportunities that lay before us. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would guide us to really understand what you would want us to do with the opportunities that presently lie before us. We pray, Father, that we might be more effective stewards of these opportunities, that we might, more, might be more pleasing in your sight. But, Father, we do pray earnestly that your purpose would be affected in each of our lives. That each of us in the days ahead can find confirmation that we of the path that you would have us on to be more effective for you for the kingdom that's coming and for the king that we so desperately want to serve. We thank you, Father, for going to such extremes on our behalf as to give us this Redeemer, this Goel, this kinsman Redeemer, this our, our King. We, we thank you, Father, for the gift of Yeshua, our King indeed whose name we do pray. is a massive racist ideology that is growing throughout the Middle East and the Muslim world. The man sitting next to me can certainly tell us he was a terrorist. A former PLO terrorist. Former terrorist now living in the U.S. Former Muslim terrorist. And raised a Muslim. Fighting for the justice of Israel. We have to stand with Israel. Judea is the heart of the Jewish people. Walid Shobat. Walid Shobat. Walid Shobat. Walid Shobat. One word caused me to believe in the truth of the Bible, and that's the word Israel. Good friend. And Husseini was the Mufti of Jerusalem, good friends of Adolf Hitler. Why did Adolf Hitler like Islam so much? 
Well, he saw it as a more fitting religion and a more fitting system for even Germany. In fact, very few Westerners know how much Adolf Hitler did compliment Islam. And he actually criticized what he called the flabby religion of Christianity. And because Islam gave pride to people, it was fit for the motherland, or fatherland in this case, for Germany, that they would have this kind of pride that would call for war. That because Islam was a religion of war and Nazism had a lot in commonality with Islamists. In other words... But wait a second. Our last couple of presidents have said Islam is a peace-loving religion. <laughs> Islam is not a peace-loving religion. So why do they say that? Because uh, they have to cloak something that is so obvious. No one walks around saying Judaism is a loving religion or a peace-loving religion or Christianity is a peace-loving religion. Only Islam has to be cloaked because it's very obvious to people that that's a major problem. Even at the BBC, I remember we're doing a show at the BBC in England, millions listening, and I was criticized throughout the whole show. In the end, the interviewer who was criticizing me all throughout the show asked me a question. She said, uh, Walid, are you not afraid for your life? I says, only a person that knows subconsciously the truth that Islam is not a peaceful religion would ask such a question. You were raised to hate the Jew, to hate Israel with such a passion. Absolutely. I mean, they talk about replacement theology. We believed in replacement theology of literal replacing the Jews and destroying them. It's part of Islamic eschatology that we learn in school that the day of judgment will never happen until the Muslims wipe the Jews out. His dad married a, a, a woman from America and tried to uh, convert her to Islam, unsuccessful. I found the most amazing things I would ever find all throughout my life. By the time I read the first in the beginning of Genesis, I will put enmity between you and the woman. The devil always hates the woman. All cults give a second status to women. By the time I got to Daniel, I've realized that there is this issue of the Antichrist. And Daniel describes the Antichrist uh, as a person who makes a covenant for seven years, a false peace hmm. treaty. Uh, as a Muslim, I always known the Mahdi is the one that brings seven years of a peace treaty with Israel. So, you, so what, you, what he's saying is there is a Messiah figure in Islam, and he notices that the Bible describes the Antichrist with the same characteristics as the Messiah figure for Islam. What else did you see? Well, all the characteristics of the Antichrist are pretty well described in Islam as well as the good guy, you know. Um, <laughs> so they're being, they're being set up. Absolutely. If, 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 if you're Muslim, do you realize that one is right and one is wrong? Well, why did you decide the Bible was right? Why didn't you just decide the Quran was right? Now, that's a tough question because I had to go through the Bible and examine one word, Israel. When you run into Israel in the Bible, in Amos chapter 9, verse 15, it says, I will plant them in their land, that is Israel, and no longer shall they be pulled out of that land. So if the Bible is a historic manuscript, and this is where the, many of the historicists make a mistake, if it's a book on history, God plucked them out, the Babylonian diaspora, the Roman diaspora, it's talking about one verse that it's impossible to pluck Israel out. That was the Israel I lived under. And by the time I reach Isaiah chapter 63, we talk about Isaiah 53. How often do we talk about 63? 63 talks about the battle of the Messiah when he treads the wine press of the place called Edom. And then he explains something. He talks about how God became Israel's savior. So he, God, became their savior in all their afflictions. He was afflicted. So he tells us how he became Israel's savior. He suffered the same way Israel suffered. He suffered the same way in the Holocaust. If six million Jews died naked, the Messiah died naked. If six million Jews starved, he also was hungry. If six million Jews were in the ghettos, he was also in prison. If six million Jews were silent, we will never find a footage. And I watched hundreds of hours of footage in the Holocaust when I was Palestinian back in Israel. Never could find a footage where a Jew made a peep when he died going through the ovens. It was amazing. And people say that you're going too far with this interpretation. Jesus rose on the third day. Are you saying Israel rises on the third day? Absolutely, yes. Read, when I read Hosea 6, I was shocked. Hosea 6, after two days, he will revive us. 2,000 years, he will revive us so we may live in his presence. Everything parallels the Messiah 
parallels Israel. Huh. Well, what, what did you find out about Lucifer? Well, that's very interesting, because by the time you reach Isaiah 14, it talks about this person who is the king of Babylon, who comes as the Antichrist in this case, as explained other places in the Bible. He's called Hilal ibn Sahar. I went to the Hebrew. Hilal ibn Sahar is a very much Middle Eastern term, because Hilal, which Hebrew means brightness, it also means crescent moon. Crescent moon? Absolutely. Lucifer means crescent moon? Hold that thought. Wait till you find out about the seven nations that he found that will defeat the anti-Messiah. I wonder if the United States of America is in that seven. Don't go away. We'll be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. This is a wake-up call to America and the world. You need to be prepared for the prophetic events about to take place on planet Earth. God has supernaturally downloaded to Walid Shubat a revelation of the end times that is a major paradigm shift from what most Bible scholars have been teaching. And now he wants to share it with you. Call now and get Walid Shubat's prophetic hardcover book, God's War on Terror, and his four-volume DVD teaching series, Islam, Prophecy, and the End Times, all for a donation of $49, shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9103. In this groundbreaking book and prophetic DVD teaching series, you will find out the real reason the citizens of Egypt, Libya, and other Muslim nations are rising up demanding their leaders step down. Understand that Bible prophecy clearly reveals that the Ten Nation Alliance will not be Europe, but Muslim nations. Find out what the scriptures say about the United States' role in Bible prophecy. Learn why the Muslim nations are set up to follow the Antichrist and how a multitude of Jews and Muslims will receive Jesus. Jesus as their Messiah. It's the most extensive research done in history regarding the Bible from a prophetic understanding from a Middle Eastern lens. It will give a shocking evidence of how much the Bible predicted about the threat of Islam. Don't miss out on getting Walid Shubat's prophetic hardcover book, God's War on Terror, and his four-volume DVD teaching series, Islam, Prophecy, and the End Times, all for a donation of $49. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9103. Call or you can write to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural. Post Office Box 1918, Brunswick, Georgia 315. Please specify offer number 9103 or log on to SidRoth.org. Call or write today. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Walid Shabbat. And Walid was born in Bethlehem. He was raised to be a terrorist. He was bred to be a terrorist. He hated the Jew. He hated Israel. He wanted to kill Jewish people. I've been wanting to ask someone who was raised that way this question. And here's my question to you, Wallet. I have been at the museum where the Dead Sea Scrolls are. The Dead Sea Scrolls predate the Quran. Islam says that the Torah was corrupted in certain areas and the Quran is pure God. If the Dead Sea Scrolls are word for word the Torah and they predate the Quran, which one was corrupted? Well, the Quran is the corruption of the Torah and the Bible. While we accused the, the Bible of being corrupted, when I read the Bible, I realized the Quran was simply borrowing things from the Bible and borrowing apocryphal manuscripts from but, the Bible. But it mixed up a lot of things that were in the Bible, which the Dead Sea Scrolls that predate the Quran prove who did the mixing. Beyond shadow of a doubt. I mean, uh, as a matter of fact, I went to the Israel Museum as a teenager and I was wondering, I was looking at the Isaiah Scroll. It's the most amazing, fascinating archaeological mm -hmm. relic they have. And I always wondered, like, why does it speak Hebrew? It's in Hebrew. And we sang the song, Al Arda Tatkalam Arabi, Al Arda Al Arda, as Palestinians. The land cries out in Arabic. But there is a relic there that says it was crying out in Hebrew. That shocked me beyond belief that the Jews existed in that land a long time ago. And by the time you examine the Dead Sea Scroll and you begin to read the Bible, you find out there's nothing different. Absolutely nothing whatsoever. Well, let me ask you this question, because time is slipping away. You have a paradigm that actually is an old paradigm for end times that makes so much sense to me. It's so biblical. Explain 
briefly what you're, you see for end times. Well, I simply brought up an old paradigm because long time ago they used to believe that Islam did play the major role in the end times. Because if we look at the Bible, all the countries that are mentioned in the Bible that God deals with, all of them are Islamic, including all the nations that Christ deals with when he comes. When the Messiah comes to fight and the nation is mentioned that he fights, they're all Islamic. You look at Habakkuk 3. He fights against Midian, that's Arabia. You look at Isaiah 63, he fights against Edom. Ezekiel 25, God says, I will stretch out my arm, that's the Messiah, against Edom. Uh, but then where does the European Union that everyone thinks that's the end time player, where do they fit in? Nowhere. Nowhere? Nowhere at all. There's no mention. Well, what are we going to do with the Left Behind series? Well, we uh, leave it behind. No. <laughs> yeah, but that's the problem. You know, there, I mean, Rome is mentioned 16 times in the Bible, not once in destruction. Spain is mentioned twice, not once in destruction. Gaul is mentioned, not once in destruction. All the nations are to be destroyed. Even the Antichrist, you look at Ezekiel 28 all the way to 32. Who, who I, I've often wondered this, and I've got to ask a scholar in end time prophecy that has his paradigm right this question. What is 666? What does that mean? Well, there's several flavors in, 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 uh, Dan, sorry, in Revelation chapter 13. It talks about the mark or the name or the number of his name. Now, if you look at the name itself, it doesn't mean a name of a person because we look at the biblical usage of the word name. Then we can understand what the Bible is saying because in a biblical usage of name, I'll give you an example. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. But Jesus' name is not Emmanuel. He's not Mexican. His name is Yeshua. So a name is a de description. It's a title. It's a creed. So they will have a creed of the beast, which is a blasphemous creed, by the way. And it's put on a karagma. It's on a karagma, badge of servitude. Regular badge that could be on cloth, mm -hmm. has a blasphemous creed that is positioned on the foreheads of the followers of the Antichrist. That's exactly what Muslims are beginning to do. In fact, when I read the Bible, Islam talks about... But what does 666 mean? Well, there is this, another explanation is this three Greek symbols uh, that adds to 666. Well, well, that's a plausible issue. But the issue I found fascinating is when I looked at the Greek, those spoke Arabic. Really? The, for some reason, the Greek is also Arabic. And you look at the symbols, it says Bismillah with the mark of the sword. That's the mark of Islam. Bismillah means in the name of Allah. And it's in the a, name of Allah? Absolutely. That's, that, that's what that means in 666 in Absol Arabic? Absolutely. In Arabic it means in the name of Allah. No one so far would ever refute that that's what it says in the Arabic language. Okay. I have been told Allah is synonymous to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you say Allah, you're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you're saying the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're talking about Allah. Is that true? If that is true, maybe I could talk to Faisal Abdel Raouf, who wants to build a mosque by ground zero, who says the same thing, by the way. I will tell him, okay, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, my God and yours. If he says, yes, I have a convert. If he says, no, that means it's not true. Because the definition of Allah in the Quran, he is anti-Trinity. The battle is between anti, you know, the Trinitarian versus anti-Trinitarian as Islam is. It denies the Father and the Son. 1 John 2.22 tells us. Forgetting all that, I have been told that Allah is the name of the sun god. The moon god. The moon god, I mean. Absolutely. We have to understand how it came So what, the, what they're saying, so the moon god, our god created the moon along with everything else. Yes. In fact, so that's a very limited God? Yes. <laughs> in fact, the Bible gives us an allusion to this. Lilith is mentioned in the Bible, which is Alat. Alat has always been the feminine name for Allah. That was one of his consorts pre-Islam in Arabia. Alat, Allah, is a name. They're both names. So Alat later on became Ishtar and became all these things. And then in Arabia, it was worshipped as the moon god and also but these were false gods according to the script jewish scriptures absolutely they're, they're totally different gods than ever been described uh, okay. in the bible there are seven nations that walid has found mentioned in the bible that are going to be coming against the antichrist i want to know if the united states of america is one of them be right back after this word
We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. One new man. The convergence of Jews and Gentiles. The two becoming one new man in Yeshua. When Jews and Christians become one new man in Messiah Jesus, we will experience a move of God such as the world has never seen. Healings, blind eyes opened, diseases removed, miracles, supernatural events, the dead literally raised, multitudes saved, the final and greatest revival before the return of Messiah. If we want to experience God's glory right here now on earth, then we need to knock down the wall of division that separates Jew and Gentile. If you want to experience an explosive outpouring of God's Spirit, God's love, God's power, then log on to www.sidroth.org to learn more about the one new man. One spirit, one faith, one new man. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Waleed Shabbat. And Waleed, I can't wait to find out the answer to some of these questions. You see, I want to talk to someone born in the Middle East. I want to talk to someone that was raised as a terrorist. I want to talk to someone that had an encounter with the living God and with every fiber of his being loves Jesus loves the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, loves Israel. I, I want to find out from you, because of all the, the firestorm that's going on in the Middle East and all the young people that are, so, that are revolting against their governments, what is going to happen to the oil in the Middle East? It's going to be destroyed and burned, especially in Saudi Arabia. Why do you say that? Well, in Isaiah 21, it's pretty clear. The burden against the desert of the sea. That's Arabia. In fact, if people are in doubt, continue in the text. It says the burden against Arabia. And it tells us who destroys it. Arise, O Elam. Elam is Persia, Iran. Iran will burn it to a point that it will burn forever. Uh, in Isaiah 34, it's pretty clear. It will become burning pitch. And that's about Edom. Edom, of mm. course, stems from Timan, Yemen, to Didan, which is in Arabia. What is going to happen here in the West if all this oil goes up in flames? But, but that's for another show. Uh, but tell me about Egypt. What's the future of Egypt? Egypt will have a civil war, Isaiah 19. In fact, the question people should ask is why in Isaiah 19, verse 1, the Lord comes riding on a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. When was the last time they taught here in the Sunday schools, you know, let's talk about Jesus Christ coming down to Egypt, fighting Muslim Egypt. It's impossible. It doesn't even exist in the West. Yet he fights Egypt. And before he comes, there will be a civil war. Egyptian will go against Egyptian. And then the believers in Egypt, in fact, they will cry for the Lord to send them a Savior. And the Lord will send them the Savior and the Mighty One, who is the Savior, the Messiah. He will come to fight Egypt because of the persecution of the Coptic Christians, which we see already happening. I, I got so many other nations I want to ask Walid about, but we just don't have the time. So I have to ask this question. Where did you come up with that there's seven nations that are going to fight the Antichrist? Where'd that come from? Well, uh, most people read Micah 5. If you ask a Westerner, you know, where's Jesus born? They give you Micah 5. He's born in Bethlehem. But they never continue in the text. The text is pretty clear that there is this Assyrian figure who is the Antichrist, will come against Israel. Then God says, we will raise against him, the Assyrian, seven shepherds and eight princely men. Who are the seven shepherds? In fact, the Bible tells us it's the seven shepherds that will destroy the Assyrian, the Antichrist. Seven allied world leaders will get together and will stand with Israel. Okay. The million dollar question, where's the U.S. in this equation? Oh, Are we one of the seven, do you believe? Yes, sir, because if you look at Daniel 11, where most people look at the character of the Antichrist, thinking he's just a homosexual atheist person. No, he's very religious. He, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god of war, mm. and he will declare war on the strongest fortresses. In other words, he declares war on the strongest military might in the world. He doesn't win. He loses because in Ezekiel... Okay, when, he, when there's this big war in Israel, is Israel going to rise to the occasion? Absolutely. Half the city of Jerusalem will be, taken, will be invaded by these troops that comes against Israel. 
and there will be a rape epidemic in the Arab section against Jewish women. And that's pretty clear in Zechariah. When Israel sees this, it says in the Bible that the feeble amongst Judah will fight like King David. In other words, Israel will be so zealous to fight for Jerusalem and they will be victorious because that's when the Messiah will come landing in the Mount of Olives and all the believers will be with him. You know what I believe, Walid? I believe that if someone loves Jesus with all of their heart and they mix up God's plan for the Jew in Israel and they side with the world, they side with the... It's amazing. In, in Joel chapter 3, it says the nations will be judged in the last days for one sin, one sin only, dividing up my land. <laughs> so what do you do with all this turmoil? first thing you do is you repent of your sins and you make Jesus your Lord and come live inside of me, Jesus. Say it with your mouth. Read the Bible like Wally did and think for yourself. It's time. This is a wake-up call to America and the world. You need to be prepared for the prophetic events about to take place on planet Earth. God has supernaturally downloaded to Walid Shubat a revelation of the end times that is a major paradigm shift from what most Bible scholars have been teaching. And now he wants to share it with you. Call now and get Walid Shubat's prophetic hardcover book, God's War on Terror, and his four-volume DVD teaching series, Islam, Prophecy, and the End Times, all for a donation of $49, shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9103. In this groundbreaking book and prophetic DVD teaching series, you will find out the real reason the citizens of Egypt, Libya, and other Muslim nations are rising up demanding their leaders step down. Understand that Bible prophecy clearly reveals that the Ten Nation Alliance will not be Europe, but Muslim nations. Find out what the scriptures say about the United States' role in Bible prophecy. Learn why the Muslim nations are set up to follow the Antichrist and how a multitude of Jews and Muslims will receive Jesus Jesus as their Messiah. It's the most extensive research done in history regarding the Bible from a prophetic understanding from a Middle Eastern lens. This will give a shocking evidence of how much the Bible predicted about the threat of Islam. Don't miss out on getting Walid Shubat's prophetic hardcover book, God's War on Terror, and his four-volume DVD teaching series, Islam, Prophecy, and the End Times, all for a donation of $49. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9103. Call or you can write to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural. Post Office Box 1918, Brunswick, Georgia 31521. Please specify offer number 9103 or log on to Sid Roth. Org. Call or write today. Next week on It's Supernatural, my guest has been taught by God how to supernaturally travel through time. תמיד הרשתות נופלות, תכף יחזרו הרשתות, לא יכולה לדבר. דבר ראשון, הרשתות לא תמיד נופלות, תום. הרשת... מלאה, ואופן נמסר שמסופו של ראש הממשלה והשרים נחת באזור מאובטח וסודי, ובהמשך ימסור ראש הממשלה. די, די. תתרכזי בנסיעה עכשיו, בסדר? אני אני יודע, אני יודע, תחיית להירגע. התקפה משולבת שנראית מתואמת ושהצליחה להפך. אתם בתדר 102, יואו, טוב, תראה שם. יואו, תקפי, יואו! שיט! 
נבדק הקשר עם כל אזור הדרום, אזור חיפה והקריות. סגן הרמטכ"ל זיץ פועלים במתכונת חירום, שירותי כיבוי והצלה פרוסים באזורים הומי אדם. ייתכן כ... מה מתעצרים?
Everybody knows that Iran wants to destroy Israel and the West. Everybody knows that they want to conquer the world. Everybody knows that they're either on the verge of acquiring nuclear weapons or they have them already. And everybody knows that they must be stopped. But why isn't anyone doing what we all know needs to be done? The answer is one word. Fear. The psychological mechanism at play here is called cognitive dissonance. It's a subconscious denial of something so terrifying that the gravity of the threat is totally denied despite the catastrophic consequences of an action. In Israel, we don't have the luxury of deluding ourselves with rose-colored glasses. For us, allowing ourselves the indulgence of cognitive dissonance would cost us our lives. Millions of them. We've been down that road before and we're not going to do it again. Have you ever considered the implications of a nuclear Iran? A nuclear armed Iran is going to spark an arms race in the Middle East and the greater region. Whenever Iran has developed a new weapon that can be used against Israel, they've shipped it to Hezbollah. Now those missiles give Iran, through Hezbollah, the capability of hitting any target in Israel. Once the Iranian missiles are up and running on launching pads in Lebanon, they can reach not just Israel, they can reach Western targets. The Iranians carried out a test to launch a Scud missile from a barge in the Caspian Sea. Many people believe that uh, this is what the Iranians would like to do with the United States, put a missile in a cargo ship going off of our coast. From 100 miles off our coast, we've never seen it. When Mahmoud Ahmadinejad talks about a world without America not only being desirable but achievable, he could mean a strategic electromagnetic pulse attack. An EMP weapon, meaning a small nuclear bomb, detonated above the center of the United States would literally take down the entire power grid of this country. In the early 80s, Iraq was well on its way to completing construction of its own nuclear weapons. In 1981, the Israeli Air Force destroyed the Osirak reactor, preventing Iraq from becoming a nuclear power. At the time, the world predictably condemned Israel. The United States did as well. But a mere 10 years later, the U.S. was thanking Israel for saving the world from the perils of a nuclear Iraq. When terrorists hijacked Air France Flight 139 full of Jews and held them hostage in Entebbe, we didn't appeal to the UN or seek diplomatic negotiations. In the most daring and miraculous rescue mission in history, we acted decisively, freeing the hostages and bringing our fellow Jews home. The international community should have learned the futility of appeasement of evil, of attempting to pacify tyrannical dictators. It just gives them the time they need to build their strength and implement their dark and murderous schemes. In Israel, we know this. We simply can't afford to wait for the possibility that the international community will garner up the courage to support us. It'll be too late. Too late for us and too late for the world. As the nation of Israel, we have been assigned the responsibility of being a light unto the nations. And as that light, we not only have the right to defend ourselves, but the obligation to defend the rest of humanity.
There is an interesting prophecy in the book of Ezekiel that causes a lot of people trouble. Because God predicts, prophesies, 430 years of judgment on the nation. 430 years of judgment. Ezekiel chapter 4. 70 of those years, we know, are here in Babylon that serve to the nation. 300, that leaves 360 that don't fit anything. You try to fit that 360, it, it, it's a problem. But someone some time ago noticed that uh, in Leviticus chapter 26, it says, If ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. In other words, if you don't obey me the first time, I'm going to multiply your punishment by seven. And I said, well, gee, that's interesting. If we multiply the 360 by seven, it comes out to 2,520, and that's roughly the time from then throughout the end of the diaspora. And that's as far as anyone ever took it. And I thought, well, wait a minute. We, one thing we learned from Sir Robert Anderson, and we'll get to that in Chapter 9, is that God deals in 360-day years. So if we, t if we assume that these 360 times 7, these 2520 years are 360-day years, how do we put that on our calendar to see what's going on here? Well, it turns out that 2520 years of 360 days turn out to be 2483 years of 365 days and you have nine months and 21 days left over. And we go through the math here. Julian year is 11 minutes and 10.46 seconds longer than the mean solar year. The Gregarian reform recognized this and 11 days were removed from our calendar during that reform. And then you also have to figure out leap years um, because in six, uh, 2483 years you've got, uh, you divide that by four, that would give you 621 leap years, but that gives you three too many every four centuries. That gives you 18 excess. So if you go through that whole rigmarole, you've got 614 days of leap years to deal with. Anyway, when you go through all the arithmetic, it turns out that 2,520 years of 360 days is 907,200 days raw. But if you divide that on our calendar, it turns out to be 2,483 years, 9 months, 20 days, and 21 days. And you say, gee, check, that's very thrilling. What do you want me to do with that? <laughs> the answer is, I don't know. But let's try and see what happens. If we take this slide that we had a few moments ago, if you take the 2,520 years from the uh, servitude of the nation, you come to the restoration of the nation on May 14th of 1948. Well, that's kind of wild. But what happens if you take the 2,520 years from the decree of Artaxerxes, the, the end of the desolations of Jerusalem? You come to June 7th of 1967, when as a result of the Six-Day War, Jerusalem was returned to the nation of Israel. What a coincidence. <laughs> now, I'm cheating here a little bit because it's not precise to the day, but it's close because we don't know the exact days that some of these events occurred. But if you go through a servitude nation, the 70 years, by the way, are 69 years less two days because they're, again, we're dealing with 360-day years, and that works out. And if you go through all this arithmetic, you come... Uh, if July 23rd, 537 B.C. was the release, uh, then uh, May 14th of 48 is the, would be the anniversary of that. Well, that's kind of interesting. That's the day, of course, that the nation of Israel was restored as a st in statehood. In fact, where David Ben-Gurion on international radio using Ezekiel as his authority names the new Jewish home of Israel. That's kind of fun. What a coincidence. See, the rabbis will tell you coincidence is not a kosher word. Desolations of Jerusalem. Again, we take the 69 years, the last two days that are the 70 years equivalent, and we go through that whole rig rigmarole. You come to June 7th of uh, 1967, which, of course, is the, when the biblical city of Jerusalem was restored to the nation. Kind of fun stuff. So I thought I would share that with you. Um, we're out in left fringe here. This, the, you know, this is, I, 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 it's not uh, to the exact day because we're not sure of the exact day, but it's, it's because we don't know the, the trigger points precisely. But we know the seasons, and they're close. So that's kind of fun. And so Israel then becomes an exceedingly adverb great army, as, as we see in Ezekiel 37.10 and is echoed in Jeremiah 49.21. Okay. And uh, Israel takes prisoners of war, interestingly enough, in, in Jeremiah 48 and, 40, uh, 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 and uh, 49 and so forth. The region is reshaped, as suggested in Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49 and Zephaniah 2. And then Israel expands its borders, doesn't shrink, it expands, 
to be more defensible and to prosper. And so we again get to where Israel then dwells securely in the land. That describes Ezekiel 38, verse 10, 11, and 12. See the scenario that seems to suggest here. And so that would all set the stage for the attempted invasion by Magog and his bands that God, of course, quells. This is one possible, not the only, but it's one possible scenario I want you to, in your own studies come to, to take a look at. And, of course, that attempt by Magog is thwarted by the active intervention of God on behalf of Israel in Ezekiel 39. Hey, YouTubers, got a lot to share with you, so I want to try and make it quick. I don't want to waste your time. Um, this video is going to be about uh, a lot of the things going on with the, uh, the Democratic National Convention. Now, you've probably seen other videos about this, but I have different stuff. I have new stuff that you uh, haven't heard yet, so stick with me here. I want to start with, uh, with a video that I recorded the other day. Um, what it was actually while I was listening to Fox News on my XM satellite. Um, and then I'll kind of summarize after you watch that. So check this out. Hey, check this out. Uh, I know it's probably kind of loud in here because uh, I'm running 70 miles an hour in the rain and it's bouncing. But I've got an XM satellite and I was just parked at the, uh, the truck stop. Well, the funny thing is, when it doesn't have a clear signal, like this one will record, it'll, it'll store like half an hour of uh, audio. So I can pause it and, uh, you know, it's kind of like the same as a DVR for those of you that have a DVR. So it'll store up to half an hour. While I was sitting at the truck stop and I was under the canopy, you know, where the, on a fuel island. Well, when it does that, it doesn't get very clear signal. So uh, it'll like lose bits of the audio. So when it plays it back, it's real choppy. See if you can hear this. My guess is we'll get a great rendition of how good things were in the 1990s. But we're not going to hear much about how things have been the last four years. Of course, four years ago, former president speaks too highly of then Senator Obama nation, James Rosenkranz. Deeply. We're not going to hear much about how things have been the last four years. Of course, four years ago, former president speak too highly of then Senator Obama nation, James Rosenkranz. Deeply. Too highly about how things have been the last four years. Of course, four years ago, former president speak too highly of then Senator Obama nation, James Rosenkranz. Speak. We're going to hear tradition from President Clinton tonight in Charlotte. My guess is we'll get a great rendition of how good things were in the 1990s. But we're not going to hear much about how things have been the last four years. Of course, four years ago, former president speak too highly of then Senator Obama nation, James Rosenkranz. Deeply, put a floor under the get that? to recovery, Hold laid on. the foundation for them. Did you get that? I tried to play it back four times. I know it's not, you know, as clear as it should be. But it caused the audio to skip where it said Senator Obamination. Did you hear that? Speak. Did you hear much about how things have been in the last four years? Of course, four years ago, former president speak too highly of then Senator Obamination, James Rosenkranz. Speak too. Hear much about how things have been in the last four years? Of course, four years ago, former president speak too highly of then Senator Obamination, James Rosenkranz. That's crazy, Senator Abomination. <laughs> anyway, um, I do think that, uh, you know, I've been suspicious for a long time of him becoming the Antichrist, you know. Uh, there's always speculation about that, but I just thought that was interesting, so. All right, so I'm not saying that Obama is the uh, Antichrist, but I am saying that he is an abomination against God. Um, he clearly supports gay marriage. It isn't for me to go ahead and affirm that uh, I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Which the Bible says is an abomination. Uh, he clearly supports abortion, uh, even like late-term abortion, uh, even to the point where I was watching a video about him about abortion today and it said that, uh, I think it's the state of Illinois, that you know they were having babies born and then murdered, so they were issued birth certificates and then death certificates in the same day. That kind of abortion. I mean, all abortion's wrong, but that's really wrong. And then not only that, 
but he also is turning his back on Israel in their time of need, uh, where they feel that uh, Iran is so close to a nuclear weapon that it threatens their uh, existence. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, I do have a few articles here that show that Israel is uh, uh, clearly going to be on their own, and the U.S. has made it clear that, uh, here's an article right here, we won't join an Israeli attack. The U.S. does not intend to join Israel's side if it decides to attack the Iranian nuclear installations on its own. Uh, here's another one that says... Uh, the U.S. said to Iran, in case of Israeli strike, don't fire on our bases. So they're pretty much telling Iran that we don't have their back. You know, he's saying don't uh, attack our American bases because we don't support them attacking you. Here's another quick one from Debka File that U.S. Uh, uh, disowns Israel over an Iran strike. No weapons or military backup. Uh, according to something that uh, U.S. General Dempsey said, that uh, the U.S. would not be complicit in an Israeli strike against Iran, and they said that uh, America would severely reduce its uh, troops and support in the upcoming, uh, uh, what's the name of it, Austere Challenge 12, which is a joint military exercise between uh, America and Israel. So, I mean, there's plenty of information here that shows that Obama, the American administration, is telling Israel, you're on your own, we're not going to support you, and uh, we're turning our back on you. So, according to the Bible, you know, Genesis 12, 2 and 3, uh, let's see, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse them who curse you. So, anyone who curses Israel is going to be cursed. And if we uh, decide to turn our backs on Israel... God's going to turn our turn his back on us. You know, if we're not there in their time of need, he's not God is not going to be there in our time of need. The Bible makes it clear that Israel be, will be on their own. Uh America will not be there when uh when Israel comes under attack. All right, YouTubers, so I got something else that I want to cover. Uh, I know other people have covered this, but I have some new insight that uh, you probably haven't heard anywhere else. All right, so I know everybody's heard about this, where at the Democratic National Convention, um, they removed mentions of God and mentions of Jerusalem being the capital of Israel. They removed that from their platform. Uh, so that refers directly back to what I was just talking about, how you know every nation that forsakes Jerusalem or comes against Jerusalem is going to be cut to pieces. You know, God's going to destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem. So the Democratic National Convention, you know, they removed that from the platform. And uh, I believe it was Brett Baer from Fox News called out uh, Senator Dick Durbin. They were talking about it. And, uh, you know, he made mention that, you know, why is it that you remove this from the platform? You know, and I believe that if uh, nobody called them out on this, they totally would have gotten away with it. They totally would have run with it. And, you know, forsaken God, forsaken Jerusalem as the capital, you know, and that's like poking God in the eye. You know what I'm saying? So I believe they would have done this uh, and would have carried it out if they didn't get caught. But since they did get caught, they were put under pressure to put God and Jerusalem back into the platform. So I know everybody's seen this video, but, you know, for those that haven't, I'm just going to run it again. So here you go. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the matter requires a two-thirds vote in the affirmative. All those delegates in favor, say aye. aye. All those delegates opposed, say no. Aye. In the opinion of the... Let me do that again. All of those delegates in favor, say aye. aye. All those delegates opposed, say no. I, um, I guess. You've got to rule, and then you've got to let them do what they're going to do. Rule. I'll do that one more time. All those delegates in favor, say aye. 
All those delegates opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds have voted in the affirmative. The motion is adopted, and the platform has been amended, as shown on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Governor Strickland. Now, a couple things I want you to notice. Um, the people that voted no uh, were voting no against putting God and Jerusalem as the capital into the platform. So they were saying no to God and no to Jerusalem being the capital. Wouldn't you agree? And I know that the guy, uh, I, I guess he's the governor of L.A. or something like that. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, that guy, I believe that he was prompted to put uh, put God and Jerusalem back into the platform regardless of what the vote was. You know, so that's why you hear and even... Uh, Again, an even an even volume of the yays and the nays. You know, every time that he asked for a, a vote, you know, the yays got louder and the nays got louder with it. So it was about 50-50, you know, and there were even times where, according to my ear, it sounded like the nose even had a higher percentage, you know, not, not by much, maybe 55 over 45. But something that um, many people have said is that the people voting denied God three times, just like Peter. Now, when I was uh, I was praying this morning, and I actually made everything prior to this video, I made yesterday. And uh, when I'm making this part today, I was praying this morning. And, you know, I just asked the Lord to talk to me about something. And when I opened my King James Bible, I went exactly to Luke 22, uh, starting in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and well, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he, uh, he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So that's what a lot of people noticed about this video. These people denied God three times. I wish there was a rooster in the convention hall. You know, uh, do you vote to put God back in the platform? No. <laughs> you know, so I found that very interesting. Now, the icing on the cake is that when this guy went against the vote, you know, because the vote did uh, come out. A roughly 50 50 but they needed a two-thirds affirmation to amend the thing in favor of putting god and jerusalem back in when the guy said that it's my opinion that two-thirds have voted in the affirmative listen to how the place boos the motion is adopted and the platform has been amended as shown on the screen thank you very much thank you the place was booing that God and Jerusalem were being put back in the platform. So, <laughs> I mean, the uh, I, I know it's not the majority, but a large majority, uh, you know, 50% at least, were booing and mad that God and Jerusalem were restored back to the uh, platform. This was all over the news. Um, I guess it was Thursday. And something happened on Friday that really got my interest, and somebody brought this to my attention. I'll uh, uh, put their name below because, you know, give credit where credit is due. But this is something that caught my attention, well, because this person brought it up. The day after the, uh, you know, this vote where so many people denied God and booed when God was put back in the platform, uh, Hurricane Michael, Michael, pay attention to that. Hurricane Michael becomes the first Category 3 hurricane of the year. Okay? The, the day after they booed God out of the Democratic National Convention, the very first Category 3 hurricane. So what I took out of that was, okay, they denied God three times. They booed God. They denied God three times, the first Category 3. So... You got some threes there, you know, and I'm not saying 
that this is exact. You know, this is this is just my interpretation, my insight on this. So I find it interesting that three denials, first category three, okay. But it has a biblical name on it. Uh, Hurricane Michael. Now, you know, when I thought of Michael, my first instinct was to search for Michael in the Bible. And the verses that stood out to me the most were Daniel 12.1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. If you really read into that verse, there is a very serious message. Simply by looking up the name of Michael, Hurricane Michael, the day after uh, they denied God. So let's analyze this a little bit. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Um, another thing I want to say about Michael, uh, the, the mention of him in Revelation 12, 7 says, A war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Uh, and another out of Jude 1, 9, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, uh, you know, disputing about the body of Moses, uh, said the Lord rebuke you. So, from my understanding, Michael is the archangel of war, you know, uh, you know, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Okay, so back to the Daniel 12, 1. Let's analyze that. At that time, Michael shall stand up. You know, there's a spiritual war going on right now uh, between, you know, good and evil. The great prince who stands watch over your son, or watch, sorry. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. I believe that would be the Jews because, uh, you know, talking to Daniel, it was the, the sons of his people. And there's made a reference. There shall be a time of trouble such as uh, never was since there was a nation. The great tribulation is coming. There's a time of trouble coming that has never been like any other. Uh, it was, let me, let me find this reference real quick. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So, you know, again, there's going to be, uh, you know, a time of great tribulation that is worse than anything that has ever come upon the world. So back to Daniel 12.1. Uh, you know, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So, I mean, you can take a couple interpretations of that. I mean, he was speaking to Daniel. Uh, I believe that during the tribulation, a remnant will be saved. I believe that that is what it's referring to, uh, you know, because there were there will be a remnant of Jews who come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah during the tribulation. Uh, so, at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Uh now, if you want, you can also take that to mean the rapture. Uh, God's people, Jesus' church, his bride will be delivered uh, because we are also written in the book of life. Uh, but I think the more uh, preferred interpretation is speaking to the Jews during the time of the tribulation. So, wild stuff. I mean, that's... Uh, if you're really paying attention, if you're really listening, if you have spiritual discernment, there are constantly uh, things that God is communicating through um, current events, through natural disasters, through, uh, you know, evil people speaking. You know, Obama uh, and just, uh, you know, the, the population as a whole rejecting God and turning to their own wickedness and rejecting God's counsel, God's ways, God's will. So... As always, you know, I'm trying to show you that judgment is coming across this country uh, for forsaking God and especially for cursing Israel. Uh, I believe that the only reason that America is still uh, receiving any blessing at all is because we still, to some degree, support Israel. Okay, because if we bless them, God will bless us. Well, 
the political climate is turning to where we are now cursing them. And I understand that the nation as a whole, you know, there's many Christians that still, still support Israel. But the leadership, who a majority of the country, you know, a majority of the country voted Obama into office. So a majority of the will of the people put him into office. And he, our leader, whether you like it or not, is forsaking Israel. So that will rest upon the rest of us. Uh, there's an example in Scripture of David when he called for a census uh, that, you know, that was David's sin, King David's sin. Yet God brought judgment upon the country, not just David. So study that on your own time. I just want to give that reference. We are living in a very serious time, a very critical time, where the grace of God is about to be lifted, where his offer of mercy and grace is about to be, well, you had your chance, so now, now the judgment's coming because you stiffened your neck, you hardened your heart, and you did not listen to the gospel. And a time of great judgment is coming, not only on America, but upon the world, uh, because they no longer fear God, they no longer follow his ways, uh, and they pursue sin. So when people will no longer listen, got to start bringing the pain, got to get their attention. So are you ready to meet Jesus? If God decides tomorrow that, all right, America, you're done, or, you know, even the rest of the world, what if God decides that, okay, today's the day, because the Bible says that he's going to come like a thief. You know, I believe that uh, the judgment upon America is very, 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 very soon. Yet, uh, what if he decides it's tomorrow? What if he says, okay, uh, I've given you more than enough opportunity to repent and you haven't listened, so now I'm bringing the judgment. What if tomorrow is that day that he comes like a thief? Are you going to be ready? Are you going to say, okay, Jesus, I have kept my life you know, clean. I've pursued righteousness. I have uh, confessed and forsaken my sin, and I'm prepared to meet you. Are you going to say that? Are you going to be like, well, uh, you know, I was over here playing Game Boy or whatever people do these days, PSP, playing Xbox. You know, are you going to be sitting there doing something? Are you going to be sitting there, you know, watching some filthy movie when Jesus comes back? You know, are you going to be sitting there uh, fornicating? <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're uh, you know, living with somebody, sleeping with somebody outside of marriage, are you going to be doing that when Jesus comes back? Are you going to be uh, hating your brother? Are you going to be holding unforgiveness against someone? You know, these are things that I believe will cause you to be left behind. If you are living in sin and not repenting and not forgiving, uh, I believe that you will be left behind. That is my opinion. Some people have different opinions, but you need to be ready. You need to have your life upright before God. You need to know uh, if you're ready for today. The Bible teaches that the rapture is imminent. Paul thought that it was coming in his time. And the reason for that is because it causes you to be on guard. What if Jesus is coming back today? i got to be ready. And when you forget about that, you start walking in sin. And then your master comes at an hour that you think not. So be ready. I'm not saying he is coming tomorrow, but one of the day, one of these days, he's going to catch most people by surprise. But the Bible says that if you watch, you will not be overtaken like a thief. So it's your job to watch. You know, I as a watchman can show you all these things. I can show you things that are happening in current events and show you the hand of God upon the you know the earth, showing the judgment that's coming. But you have to watch. I don't have time to show you everything that comes across my radar. You know, I see things all day long that I would love to make a video about, but I don't have time. So it's your duty to watch. You need to be responsible for your own soul. You need to watch and be ready for Jesus' coming on your own. You can't rely on people like me, you know, because what if the government decides, oh, well, fire charger, he's too outspoken about Jesus and the gospel. Uh, so we're going to we're going to drag him off and throw him in jail. You know, we're going to make him disappear. We're going to shut him up. 
you know, if people like me aren't here to tell you, you have to be responsible for your own uh, awareness of what's going on. So turn to Jesus today. Be ready to meet him today, tomorrow, the next day. Clean your life up. You know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You need to be aware that if you're caught off guard and you're walking in sin, that you may be in the time that Jesus talked about the worst tribulation that the world has ever seen. I don't want to be any part of that. You know, the Bible says that um, God will spare us from the wrath to come. You know, Luke 21, 36 says, you know, Lord, uh, I pray that you find me worthy so that I escape these horrible things that are coming upon the earth. So are you worthy? Are you walking up right before the Lord? Are you repenting? Do you know Jesus? It's time to know. You know, don't think you know. Know that you know. So, wow, just praise the Lord. Uh, I feel that uh, the Lord is just calling out to those stragglers and those that are uh, not listening. Wake up. You know, you need some, some of those Epsom salts. You know, because a lot of people are, wake up. Jesus is coming. Praise the Lord. I give him all the glory for everything that was just said. I give him all the glory for every blessing in my life. And I pray that he blesses you, touches your life, and gives you eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. and thanks again for joining me um, I've got a real short video here which is called the rapture red zone wake up and prepare this is only a very brief video uh, and it's basically meant to just be an update uh, to things happening right now so let me quickly briefly uh, just give you the topics that I'd like to talk to you about the first one is I want to make an observation concerning Elenin, the sign in Egypt and the three days of darkness and I want to briefly talk about the increasing birth pains preceding the rapture event we've been experienced uh, since the beginning of this year. Uh, in the third topic there is called the delay and Yeshua's literal fulfillment of Matthew 25 and then uh, the fourth chapter of this video series is called Revelation 12 and the birth of the morning star as well as how to get saved now and some tribulation no-nos. So let's get straight into this. Um, the first video again is called Observation, Elements, Sign in Egypt and the Three Days of Darkness. Now. The past few days has been very interesting and I'm sure you all agree tensions were running high with expectancy. And that's exactly what God wants from us, you know, his bride. We must live with expectant hearts daily. Second Peter 3 12 says, as you look forward to the day of God and eagerly wait for it to come. So we ought to look forward to it. I want to take this opportunity to address some of the questions I've been getting concerning Ellen and, and the sign in Egypt as well as uh, the three days of darkness. Now, first of all, I assume everybody is familiar with the term hypothesis and when I say this I say this on behalf of all watchers we do what God has instructed and inspired us to do to watch and to warn and we do this for your benefit now when we including myself were making the hypothesis that earth might be covered in darkness for three days we were giving you information that had the potential uh, as was observed by astronomers and we simply report their observations and look for public connections to ascertain the uh, you know the imminence of the time there Apart from scripture, you know, which which is not an hypothesis, this is, you know, the truth. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, uh, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So scripture, you know, is infallible. This is the word of God and this is not an hypothesis. You know, what we believe and what we say and certain things that we 
uh, you know, interject in our observations that, that those things might be faulted, those things might be an hypothesis, but not scripture. Now, any connections that may or may not exist in our findings or hypothesis can only be viewed as an inference to the facts stated by scripture. Sometimes we may be right and other times we may be wrong and it's then when the mockers and the scoffers have a field day so to speak. You know the funny thing is these guys are always back to check our updates. So um, you know for the mockers and the scoffers out there I've got a new update for you guys stay tuned. Second bit of three, 3 says knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant. So the Bible is saying here that scoffers and mockers are willingly ignorant. And this is a very dangerous thing to do uh, if you choose to be ignorant and ignore God's word. So Mr. Mocker and Mrs. Scoffer, there you have it. Your jobs in these last days are to mock and to scoff. And if you did not do that, my goodness, we wouldn't have known we're in the last days. Proverbs 16 verse 4 says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. So the mockers and the scoffers were made for this time and for this day so that we can know that we are indeed in the last days. They are, I would suppose, one of the signs of the last days. But let me continue on and talk to the real people who is eagerly waiting uh, for our Lord's return. And let me encourage you to be ready because that's the real reason. I make these videos. Now concerning Ellen and I think we can all agree that it is a sign in the heavens placed there by God to warn his people to get ready. Genesis 1.14 talks about God putting the stars, moon and the sun in the heavens as signs to signal his appearing. And Luke 21 verse 28 says we ought to look up for our redemption draws nigh. Now what do we see when we look up? Well the heavens. So it's giving an indication that we ought to look for something in the heavens that will signal his appearing. Right now you've got record solar activity, a record number of near-Earth asteroids passing Earth, and you have this strange object called Comet Elenin passing right by on the Feast of Trumpets. You also have the sign of Revelation 12 appearing exactly on the first day of the Feast of Trumpets this year. In fact, it is blatantly obvious God is literally screaming the signs at us. Ellen is no doubt under intelligent control, and I believe it has been placed in that orbit by God for our benefit. Let me break it down for the scoffers. Elenin is a sign that Yeshua is about to appear. Now Dr. Hoagland, if you wanted to know why this object has been placed in this very carefully designed orbit, well there you have it. It's been placed there so God's children can prepare and get ready. This thing is a sign to God's children and it is coming right on a specific festival which we know to be the Feast of Trumpets and it is to alert God's children that this is the season. You know the Bible says Jesus commanded uh, you know his people to he said to them how is it that you know the you know the, the seasons of you know the, the you know the natural seasons the rain you know the, the summer but you don't understand the seasons of God's timing how is it that you can't tell you know God's timetable since you know all these things. So th these things are pointing and is signs towards God's timetable so that God's children can prepare and get ready. The Pyramid of Giza in the sign in Egypt has been placed there as a sign. And as we've discussed uh, in that video, it is a duplicate of what would come and is currently in orbit close to Earth. Now this tetrahedron shaped object currently in space looks like a pyramid. It may not have the exact four sided dimensions, but it looks like it. And that's what I believe the connection is with Ellen and, and the message in Isaiah 19 talking about how, uh, you know, the oppressed would be delivered uh, and it's using the pyramid shape as a sign pointing to this time and possibly to this object pointing in space. It's basically have, giving us a reference point. Say, look, when this thing appears that looks like a pyramid, this would be the time when your redemption draws nigh. You know, as far as the three days of darkness is concerned, the fact that it will happen is certain. And it's entirely biblical when you study the book of Joel and, and some other passages in the Bible. Uh, but as, as it became evident, this w was definitely not the time. Then again, scripture says, But ye brethren, is not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief in the night. First Thessalonians 5. Now this could also mean we won't be here when darkness falls on the earth. Now this could also mean this event could take place immediately or shortly after the rapture of the church. Remember, Elenin will be at its, at its closest approach to earth on or around October the 17th. Uh, you know, so this event could still unfold at a later date. In this section, I want to very briefly talk to you about the increasing birth pains preceding the rapture event. Now, I'm a little short on experience here, but my wife tells me, you know, things get real tough just before the baby is born. I want to ask you this. Is it coincidence that on February the 22nd earlier this year, we had a sign in the earth 
in the form of an earthquake hitting a town called Christchurch, New Zealand. And five days later, we see yet another coincidence on February 27th as a massive 8.8 earthquake uh, struck the city of Concepcion in Chile. So right at the start of this year, God was announcing the conception of Christ. Fast forward to September the 29th, we see a very rare sign appear in the heavens that perfectly matched that of Revelation 12. Revelation 12, 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Revelation 12, 2 says, And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. So this woman is carrying full term. She's about to deliver this baby. Now, since the start of this year, we had numerous earthquakes, record number of floods, tsunamis, volcanic activity, and recently typhoons, and the list goes on. Now, this in concert with Palestine, uh, you know, about to be declared a state, the blatant hatred for God's people, the Jews, with certain on the horizon, the imminent collapse of the global economy ushering in a new monetary system controlled digitally, which we know is the mark of the beast of Revelation 13, and many more indicators are evidence that these birth pains has been increasing, and very soon, birth will be given to our redemption. So where are we now? That's the topic of our next segment. In this section, I want to talk to you about the delay and Yeshua's literal fulfillment of Matthew 25. The Feast of Trumpets officially ended on October the 1st at 6.35 p.m. Jerusalem time. Now, we were waiting with much anticipation for the revelation of our redemption, as I'm sure you were too. When you look in Matthew 25, a similar scenario plays out with the ten virgins all waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. Now, who's telling the parable? Yeshua. So, Jesus is saying, you'll expect me and all of you will be waiting. But I will come with a delay, and at that time of the delay, some of you will go in and some will not be ready. So let's briefly listen as Yeshua tells the parable of the ten virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So as you've heard, there was a delay prior to the arrival of the bridegroom. All these virgins expected him at a certain time. And they all were most likely awake at that time, you know, that they expected him. But the parable says they fell asleep while the bridegroom delayed to arrive. Now to state the obvious, I think we all agree there was a delay. And the five wise virgins knew to make preparations just in case he would be delayed. What did they do? Well, they took extra oil. What does that mean to us waiting for our bridegroom right now? The extra oil simply means they equipped themselves in case they had to wait a little while longer. And for us it simply means we have to recognize there will be a delay, it is expected, and even Jesus himself made this delay known to us. So what's the equivalent of filling our lamps with extra oil? Well, most biblical scholars agree the oil refers to the Holy Spirit, and I believe it means we should stay in the Spirit during this delay. In other words, don't go about your normal business during this delay period. I'm not saying don't go to work. I'm saying watch and wait and stay focused on Jesus in this time. But how long will this delay be? A few days? A week? A month? Or perhaps a year? When you take scripture literally, it says the bridegroom eventually came at midnight that same day. So clearly this delay was not that long, but how long can the bride expect to wait? The short answer is not long. 
As to the time, let's consider the following. First of all, Jonah was a messenger of doom, just like how you know judgment is coming upon the earth. Now he's he was a messenger of doom to the city of Nineveh, but on his way there, he was delayed for three days while being in the belly of the fish. Jesus, after he was crucified, went down, you know, to the grave to Hades for three days, and he preached. The Bible says uh, to those uh, souls that died before his crucifixion, and then after the third day, he resurrected those souls and they went up to heaven with him but he was the first fruits of the dead the bible says now these are just two scriptures i've highlighted and again it is entirely my hypothesis but what if the rapture event has a delay of three days you know this might very well be the case i don't know we'll see that would mean yeshua is literally fulfilling matthew 25 as we've heard earlier that would also mean many that were watching then during the expected time will be going about their normal business unaware that the bridegroom could come literally three days later to resurrect the dead and gather the believers unto himself. Now this may or may not be the case, but please consider this when a woman is pregnant uh, and is in pain to deliver the baby, do you think she can hold off of giving birth to that child another week or month or even a year? I'm sure you ladies would agree absolutely not. In this section, I want to very briefly talk to you about Revelation 12 and the birth of the morning star. Revelation 12, 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Again, this woman is pregnant, you know, she's about to give birth, and we are right at that threshold. We saw the sign on the 29th of this woman that is about to give birth. Remember the town conception in Chile? And remember Christ Church in New Zealand? Well, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, has been conceived and God is about to give birth to our redemption. So let's see what happens three days from the end of the Feast of Trumpets on the 1st of October. And let's see what happens on October the 4th of this year, 2011, which is three days exactly from the end of the festival. Now, I may be wrong about this, but man, if I'm right, you want to pay close attention to the following events appearing in the heavens. The program I'm using is called Stellarium and it's free to download, just google it and you can have a look at this yourself. But let me show you what happens three days from the end of the Feast of Trumpets. And again I want to give all our watchers credit that contributed to this info. If I came across this or looked at this more closely earlier, you guys would have heard it by now. But here's what happens in the heavens three days from the end of the Feast of Trumpets. Okay guys, so uh, at the moment we are on the 30th of September as you can see here, Saturn and Venus. Uh, both in the womb of the woman. If I can just switch this uh, graphic on there, you can see there. They're sitting right here in the womb. And if you run this forward, one, two, three, four. On the fourth day, or three days after the feast, we can see that Venus gets born. And Venus, if you can go to research on this, is known as the brighter morning star. Jesus calls himself the brighter morning star in Revelation 22. And on this day, exactly three days um, after the festival, we see Venus exiting the womb of Virgo. Uh, it just so happens that Saturn on the 11th of the 11th, 2011, also comes out of the womb. And those Saturn years referring, um, you know, to Satan, which uh, stood before the woman with child, ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. So could this be an indication that our Messiah which, you know, he's three days late, or will be three days late. Could this possibly be, and again, I stress the word possibility, could this possibly be uh, the birth of our redemption on this day, the 4th of um, October? And I wanted to leave that thought with you, uh, which I think is very well worth considering. Uh, you have to understand this sign here, uh, with, you know, with this woman, if you go back on the 29th, you can see the moon's at her feet, she's clothed with the sun, you know, Venus and, and Saturn sitting in the womb there. And this basically, if you've heard about the Hopi prophecy, it's referring here to the, you know, the blue star and the red star Kachina. Uh, this is also referring basically, what, what this means is, uh, you know, together with our redemption, judgment is coming on the earth. So first Christ is coming, he's taking his bride away. And then on the 11th of the 11th, uh, 2011, Saturn is born. Uh, and I really believe that this is a time of great judgment that is officially starting on the earth. But then, you know, um, we will be taken out. It just happens on the 8th and the 9th of uh, November. You know, FEMA has an emergency broadcasting uh, a test going on at that time. Could it be that during that time, 
you know, terrible things that would have taken place by then. Uh, you know, possibly the Rapture, most likely the Rapture. Uh, and they've very uh, conveniently left open two days, uh, you know, possibly for the Antichrist to make his first global address on those two days. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking why else would they open up two days on major broadcasting stations, or, or rather all the broadcasting stations as far as I've heard uh, in the U.S. during those two days, critical days on the 8th and the 9th. You also have an asteroid on the 8th and the 9th crossing Earth in very close proximity uh, during those two days. Um, you know, so there's terrible things coming on the Earth, people, but I found this very interesting uh, after the festival, and you can see here clearly, you know, that Venus is out of the womb here. So could we see an rapture event taking place on this day? You know, this is, you know, three days after the actual event that, that has been expected. We've all been waiting. And I really believe that this is, <laughs> this is very likely. I mean, how long can you be pregnant for? And you know, this woman is pregnant, and you can see here that clearly Venus is being born um, three days after the festival. Um, I wanted to make this video just to let you guys know to be watching. Now, I believe that date could potentially be a most interesting one to watch, and one that is certainly worthy of the attention of every believer waiting on this blessed hope. Now, this video has been a short and sweet update to simply tell you, my brothers and sisters, in Christ, it ain't over till the fat trumpet blows. My precious sister in Christ, Jeanette Soto, said it perfectly when she said being delayed does not mean the trip has been cancelled. So now more than ever, you guys really need to watch. And I'm very serious when I say this. This is a time where I call, you know, the red zone. You know, this is the rapture red zone. And this is the time when a lot, a lot of people is going to be caught out not watching. Why? Because they expected him. He's delayed. They fell asleep. They ran out of oil. This is the time you need to watch. You know, how long can this woman keep this baby inside a womb? You know, Jesus, our redemption is about to be born. And we need to keep our eyes focused. We need to be looking upwards because our redemption is indeed drawing nigh. In this section, I want to talk to you about how to get saved now and some tribulation no-nos. Now, again, this has been a very short and sweet video. And I just merely intended this for, for this to be an update, uh, not an in-depth study. But I want to talk to those people out there that don't know Jesus Christ yet. Friend, I don't know who you are or what your beliefs are, but I want to tell you Jesus Christ is really the only way to heaven. After the rapture event, many people will die. In fact, the Bible says a total of two-thirds of the earth's population will die during this horrible time to come. That's more than four billion people that will die. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're going to be on the receiving end of God's wrath. And believe me, you don't want to be part of that crowd. Since the beginning of creation, God has mapped out His redemption plan for mankind in the heavens. And He sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the sacrifice that would pay the penalty of sin on behalf of all mankind. Jesus offers you salvation free of charge, and all you have to do to be saved and escape what is to come is to accept Him and His offer. Now, if you want to make that decision today, let me invite you to say a simple prayer with me. Simply say, Lord Jesus, I come to you just as I am. I repent and confess my sins and ask that you cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe that you have died on the cross of Calvary and that you are the Son of God. Write my name in the book of life today and send your Holy Spirit to dwell inside of me, to guide and teach me in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you've said this prayer, please get in touch with me. And remember, watch my video on how to get rapture ready so that you can understand some of the things that Satan's using on believers uh, so that you can be ready and so that you can prepare. And also, please, uh, you know, send me a note. Just let me know if you said this prayer so I can pray for you. For those that choose to ignore this message, you know, right now, I'd like to give you some advice which may very well save your soul during the tribulation period. During the coming tribulation period, which is seven years long, a world leader known as the Antichrist uh, to Christians will rise and uh, being possessed by Satan himself will cause every human being on the face of this planet to receive a mark of some sort. Revelation 36 gives you some more information about that. But without this mark, which by the way is a physical implant in either your right hand or on your forehead, you will not be able to buy or sell anything. Now, if you receive this mark, which will be a digital implant of some sorts, uh, promoted under the false pretenses of security and health benefits, the Bible says you'll doom your soul to hell for all eternity. Go and read Revelation 13 to get some more information on that. Not being able to buy or trade without this mark, you'll potentially starve to death. Now, if you choose not to receive the mark and to then accept the saving grace of Jesus Christ afterwards, your faith will undoubtedly be tested even unto death. 
Those that choose to follow Christ will almost certainly be beheaded, and even this is recorded in Scripture in the book of Revelation. So the price of ignorance now is a very expensive one, and to think the Bible says scoffers are willingly ignorant. Friend, if you've been scoffing and mocking the saving grace of Jesus Christ, you need to repent and ask Jesus to forgive you. Now, I only have two things I want you to remember if you've been left behind after the rapture event. First of all, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and serve Him with all your heart and mind in faithfulness even unto death. And number two, no matter how alluring, safe, convenient, impressive, or right it appears to take the mark at the time, if you do, you'll end up in hell and that's guaranteed. So do not take the mark. It will be hard and it will be an almost certain death sentence, but if you prevail and endure, your soul will be saved and you'll get to see your Christian loved ones, uh, you know, again, that was taken during the rapture event. You live again with Christ, uh, Jesus, and reign with Him a thousand years, even unto all eternity. Now, I'd rather wish for you to accept Him now than to go through all of these horrible judgments coming onto the earth. But since many will still choose to be ignorant and completely ignore this very deadly warning, I want to just, uh, why don't you just keep these two points in mind and it may very well save your soul. To all my brothers and sisters out there, keep the faith, keep your light burning and keep watching in this red zone we're currently in. Because any moment our Savior Jesus Christ will come for us. Remember all the signs are lining up this year. All the signs are pointing that His return is imminent. And like I said, you know, this is a crucial time to be watching. You guys can't let go. You guys can't cool down. You need to stay on your toes. You need to stay watching. And you need to make sure that your lamps are filled with oil. So look up for your redemption draws nigh. Yahweh bless.